Go where your best prayers take you, unclench the fists of your spirit and take it easy. Breathe deeply of the glad air and live one day at a time. Know that you are precious and learn to trust. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to all of you who made it to church. It's lovely. And again, a shout out to everyone on YouTube and um, Channel 12. Many of you have stayed home, probably judiciously. It is a bit difficult driving around the city, but it's a lot of fun, a lot of energy downtown. Um, and a shout out to everybody. And boy, I'll tell you, across the United States and across Knoxville today uh, in the parish, we're glad you've joined us. Um, a few shout outs. Jim Haslam's in the hospital, so I know they're watching. And hello. And a good friend of mine, Steve Grumman, who had really rugged um, mouth and throat surgery. And he's in Birmingham. So good morning, Steve. And he's an Episcopal priest of a lot of years and a great guy. Um, and hope he does well. Hope this lifts the spirit as it does all of ours, being together. Um, of course, the road race captures all of our attention. Some of you don't know, there's an eight-foot dog running the marathon. That dog's name is Whitney Ross. <laughs> he is dressed up like a dog for dog church, and he's running the marathon. <laughs> Not, ma I, am I telling you? I am telling the truth. It's true. You have to test his intelligence, but it's all right. He, you know, he was an ultra marathoner. He runs 100 miles, 120 miles. He said, oh, this is a warm-up, smart Alec. No, but he wanted to, he's handing out cards for dog shirts for Lakeshore. It's hysterical. Uh, he's added a lot of fun. So we've got lots of pictures. You'll see them. We're going to blow him up with these pictures. I said, you're going to be on national television, maybe for the wrong reasons, but you're going to be on. So he's, he was going to try not to do a face plant in that eight-foot costume. He is running the costume. Go, Anyway, well, I'm going to get straight to the gospel because it's such a powerful story. And I want you to do something with me today because um, this story is such an awkward one. We've got clergy here, and I promise if you've been a clergy person, if you've been a clergy person for the millennial, <laughs> we all don't like to preach what this story says it is. Not kidding. Because it's not what it is, what we think it is. I want you to take it out of your head, all that theological stuff that church has said, and I want you to put it in your heart. And I want to put it in your lives. This is a story story, human story, powerful human story. Unfortunately, it has a bad little notion about it. You know, Thomas, one of the disciples, when we meet him this morning, I want you to think actually where he is here. Where is he? He's mourning the loss, the death of one of his best friends. In fact, he witnessed his death. He witnessed it. He sat there and watched the beaten, bruised, destroyed body of Jesus die. He has lost a mentor, friend, teacher, rabbi, someone who he pledged his life to. They're like this. That's how close it is. This is not a head story, it's a heart story. He gave his life to him for three years, obeying instructions, trying to follow directions. He's been listening, watching, studying, learning. He's been to the mountaintop, and man, he is in the depth of depths today. And so he and his friends are locked up. They've locked themselves in. I want you to catch a little something that I'm not going to preach about. By the way, this is a little Bible study this morning because I want you to take it deeper. It's more meaningful for all of us. But they're locked up. But remember, they're Jews. It says, for fear of the Jews. <laughs> he is a Jew. Maybe they're just afraid. Maybe all this terrible stuff that's happened has just gotten them paralyzed in fear. And then... The friends that he's locked up with, who have had an experience he hasn't said, by the way, Jesus is alive. We've seen him. <laughs> okay. And the story read for centuries is what? We call him Doubting Thomas. One nanosecond, one nanosecond of slowing down and saying, oh, whoa, just a minute. And he carries this badge of dishonor for all of history. 
You are aware of that. Oh, come on. You are. I am. I mean, what does mama think about the people talking about it? I mean, be real. This is a real story. Seriously? He wanted a little evidence, and somehow we pin on him words that never, Jesus never says of him. He's doubting. And then what did it do to so many of you? It spun you into a place where you cannot ask questions. Your, your faith is neg in the negatory place when you doubt a little bit. Good gracious. Let's be honest. It's human. This is a human story. The church has done this forever. Theologize things that are human stories, and sometimes they come out sideways. This is a sideways story. This is not a story about doubt at all. That's not even what the story's about. The church sometimes separates us from our humanity. Ever separated you from your humanity, who you really are? I want you to dig deep now with me. It's a real story. The church does that. We're fallible. And when I mean the church, it's kind of like above us somewhere, this theological dome we're under. So we're going to deny things like we doubt, like we need verification, like when we don't understand what we don't understand. That's the truth. You think you're going to live, live, live or leave here differently? No, you're not. You're going to function that way. It's a dysfunctional story to tell it that way. Okay, enough. <laughs> but I've made my point. And every clergy person knows it. But sometimes they have to tell it that other way. I don't have to do that. Y'all give me permission to kind of do that. I appreciate it. Faith, better word is trust, doesn't come easy, does it? And so this constantly focusing on Thomas kind of dragging his feet a little bit. You see, we're blinded by what the real experience within the story is about. You know, I was at the YMCA the other day a couple of weeks ago, this occurred. But I go there now to exercise regularly. I'm back home, that's where I grew up. I grew up at the YMCA in Memphis, Tennessee. It was a home away from home for me from my whole childhood. And I took a break from my exercise to go grab some water and I went around kind of a, a little corner in the big weight room at the Y out west. And you can look down on the pool, there's a window. And I looked down and it was a fabulous sight because the pool was jam-packed with little bitty people <laughs> and lots of lifeguards and they were giving swimming lessons and it just thrilled me to watch them. All these little kids in different places. But the ones right beneath me were on the ramp to this pool that goes downhill and there were two lifeguards out front and these little guys were in their little puffy, you know, wings and they're straddling and they'd say, come on, come on. They'd walk down, walk back, walk, and they'd finally go and jump in. And I was watching them do that, and then boom, I was freeze-framed, I was five years old again. I mean, it was so instant, it, it almost took me by surprise. It buckled my knees. I'm not exaggerating. I'm standing there, I kind of put my hand on the wall. And I was back learning to swim in Memphis, Tennessee, at a city pool that my mom had taken me to. It was seven in the morning, the air was chilly. It was early June, really cold for Memphis time. And there I was standing in a towel with a bunch of kids that I didn't know in a place I had never been, and I was supposed to get in that water. And it was cold, and I knew the water was going to be cold. But eventually, the people leading got me to take my towel off, and we, um, smart or not, they had us jump in the water, not walk into the water. So I jumped in the water, and it was more cold than I thought. It was freezing. And my knees were knocking. Not because of the cold, it's because I was scared to death. I was frightened out of my wits about that day. Still stays with me. I mean, I can feel it viscerally. You ever have one of those? What was worse was not only the water freezing cold, but so were the instructors. Come on, you can do this. Don't be a baby. Come on, put your face in the water. Come on, let's get with it. You can do this. Now, I can't prove those were the exact words but what their words were, I translated correctly. And they are printed in my brain, and I'm 69 years old. For that reason, my mother took me from that lesson and went straight to the YMCA, <laughs> where there was an indoor pool, indoor pool and the water was warm. And so were the instructors. They welcomed me. They smiled. They laughed. They conjoled us. They said, it's okay to be afraid. 
They said, not a big deal. It's going to go, come on, keep, you can do this. You can do this. Shoot, I think on the second swimming lesson, I jumped off the high dive. And then I was swimming. By the way, not well. I'm still not a very good swimmer. I'm taking lessons again. This is going to be a life lesson. But, man, that stayed with me. And did it come to me? Thomas is face to face with Jesus. He was dead as dead can be. In the story day, he falls down on his knees and says, my Lord and my God. Maybe the last part was the emphasis. My God, what is happening? And I want you to pay attention what happens. Jesus doesn't, he's, he never uses the word that we use, and I'm not even going to say it again. He just holds him in a way. I imagine he kind of picks him back up. And then what does he do? He breathes on him gently, almost like a kiss. One of those friendship kisses. You give someone on the cheek. Not a story about what we say it is. It's a story of love. Flat out period love. Of Thomas to Jesus but Jesus to Thomas and from Thomas to you and me centuries later. This is a story of pure, pure love that if we will see it, if we will accept it, and it will take you some work to get there, not be aware, but to really accept it, that Jesus is breathing on us all the time his spirit is pouring down upon us day by day, minute by minute, filling us up, supporting us, leading, guiding, and loving. And then I think urging us to love, that we breathe on others, that we hold and caress them, particularly when they're afraid, particularly when they're unsure, particularly when they're not welcomed, particularly when they do not fit, even in their own skin, when you do not fit in your own skin and I do not fit in my own skin, which happens more often than I would care to count. That's what this is all about. It's a deep story, another week of a deep story of the most divine love than we can imagine. I always kind of think for the church, then there are always questions. You may have questions. I do. I've continually questioned. But I sure question today. And I wonder, what kind of lifeguards do we want to be? Amen.